This week's episode is sponsored by Audible. Get your free audiobook at investlikeaboss.com slash audio. Welcome to the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm Sam Marks. And I'm Johnny FD. We're self-made entrepreneurs who invest our own money and use modern technology to invest like a boss. Join us each week for exclusive interviews with our network of modern investors, business owners, and multimillionaires to discover new ways to invest our hard-earned cash. Hey guys, it's Johnny and welcome to episode 76 of the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm here with Sam Marks. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Johnny. I'm good, man. How are you? Yeah, really cool. So I'm still on the Canary Islands for a few more weeks and you are back in Chiang Mai, right? Yeah, I uh, was doing a three-week trip down Vietnam and it got a little rowdy. That's another story for another episode. And we decided to come home early. So I'm back in the peaceful tranquility of Chiang Mai. Okay. I like it. Well, that's been too tranquil because it's been raining there. Yeah. No, the weather's perfect. I'm excited to be back. And funny enough that I'm in Chiang Mai and I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to meet one of our best guests ever, someone I've been looking forward to meeting and interviewing for a very long time, Dr. Mark Faber, who is also happens to be a resident of Chiang Mai. How crazy is that, that we have economists and you know, authors who have been on CNBC, Fox Business, Bloomberg TV, a lot of these huge news outlets. And he lives, like he spends, what, half the year in Chiang Mai, Thailand. Yeah, so I think he moved here like maybe 18 years ago. Uh, So before the whole digital nomad movement, of course. But he came out here, was spending a lot of time in Asia, spends a lot of time in Hong Kong, and fell in love with the area, just like so many of us have. And for all those who are not familiar with Dr. Mark Faber, he's the editor and publisher of the Gloom Boom Doom Report. You can check it out, website, www.gloomboomdoom.com. But man, he this is a super, super reputable guy. Like Johnny said, CNBC all the time, Bloomberg, The Economist, just about anywhere you look, you can find his name and you'll find his predictions. And... Um, I think a lot of commonalities to one of our previous guests, Harry Dent. Yeah, and he is – he's been around for a long time. Do you know how old he is? I don't. But having already done this episode, this guy is like a history book. And it was so fun picking his brand. I think everyone's going to get a lot out of this episode, not just about history, but also, of course, about markets, economies, geopolitics, and something that he doesn't talk about ever – that we got him to talk about on this episode, cryptocurrencies. Yeah. So I'm, I'm definitely curious to find out what Mark Faber thinks about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. I just looked it up. He is 71 years old. He was born in 1946 and he has been through a lot. He's been through ups and downs in the stock market as well as the real estate market and just, you know, like literal, you know, gloom, dooms and booms of the the markets in the US as well as you know the rise of the markets in Asia you know which is he which we know he's a big fan of uh, he's he's been through a lot he's like an old school guy so don't expect him to be super politically correct or you know mm-hmm. he he just shoots us straight and he's like this is my opinion this is what i've been through and i'm excited to learn more absolutely we actually recorded this episode in his house in Chiang Mai in his personal library and it was in the middle of this pretty tenacious thunderstorm. It was just a really cool setting. He's got a a library that anyone would envy behind him. You can just see how much reading and how current he stays through all this literature. Um, So you will hear that rain and you will hear that thunder in the background. It's just the end of rainy season here in Chiang Mai, but it was was a lot of fun. Uh, This episode's a classic and definitely one I would encourage listening to all the way through. Well, I think that's the perfect backdrop for gloom, boom, and doom. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) So here we go. Here is Mark Faber. So guys, we're sitting back here with Dr. Mark Faber. Dr. Faber, it's a pleasure and privilege to be with you today. (laughs) It's my pleasure. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. So you've been asked just about every question in the book. And what always amazes me with with you is of all the times that you're being interviewed, sometimes on these panels at CNBC, (laughs) it's 10 people And you, I'm just so curious about how you stay so current with geopolitical economies, currencies. It must be an enormous amount of information to to stay up and stay current on. Yes, of course, uh, I wouldn't say we have an overload of information, but say 
when I started to work uh, on Wall Street in 1970, basically the world was relatively simple because India and China were still closed societies and investors around the world, they would uh, largely invest in the early 70s, uh, there were very few international investors. But the international investors that existed in Europe and in Asia, they would essentially invest in American growth stocks. And uh, in the case of Asia, investors would also invest in uh, Canadian equities. So say in Hong Kong, when I arrived in 1973, all the foreign brokers basically invested uh, in American securities and among the American brokers and there were maybe eight at that time in Hong Kong none of them would invest anything in Asia there were some British brokers and these British brokers they served Scottish and British institutions who invested in Hong Kong partly because uh, of British uh, connections to Hong Kong Hong Kong at the time was a colony of Britain they also invested a little bit in Singapore and in Malaysia. But otherwise, the money flows were from Asia to the US and Canada. Canada partly because Hong Kong Chinese always uh, were interested to migrate to Canada. And there wasn't an Indonesian stock market. There wasn't a Chinese stock market. And most of the other Asian markets, they were not open to foreign investments, to foreign investors. So the world centered around America. The saying was, if America sneezes, Asia catches a cold. And geopolitically, we had basically the Cold War. And in 1970, the Vietnam War was still raging, but it had no impact on equity prices. And so the world was relatively simple. And in the U.S., you just focused on essentially money supply figures, uh, in other words, a little bit the bond market and on stocks would they go up or down and so forth and on the economy. But nowadays, uh, first of all, we have international markets. So we have money flowing from Asia to the rest of the world and we have money flowing from the rest of the world into Asia. Many more stock markets are open like China, India, Indonesia, also Korea, Taiwan. They existed at that time, Korea and Taiwan, but they were close to foreign investors unless you had some connections, like I had some connections and I could invest there. But uh, the world has become a much bigger place and because of the breakdown of the socialist and communist ideology and the emergence of new countries on the block like China, just considering 1970. China consumed precisely 2% of global metals consumption. In other words, they consumed 2% of all industrial commodities. Today, this is close to 50%. So there has been a major shift in the balance of economic power from essentially the US and Western countries to new countries such as China. Mm -hmm. And then we have a much more complex geopolitical condition in the sense that we had a bipolar world through the Cold War. We had essentially Russia and then the US or the US and Russia. And today we have new powers like India and we have the Middle East that has become population-wise a very important region. And we have Africa, we have China and so forth. And uh, we have unlike in the 70s, massive interventions by central banks. In other words, the markets are no longer functioning as markets, free markets, but they're being manipulated largely by central banks. And then that has an impact on currencies, has an impact on interest rates, has an impact on all asset prices. And about asset prices, I just like to say, when I started to work in 1970, we had basically two asset classes, bonds and equities. And after the devaluation of the US dollar in August 1971, currencies became a consideration. 
But now you have commodities, you have real estate, and all these asset classes, they have securities which the individual investor and the institutions can buy. And now for the last three, four years, we have a totally new asset class, which are cryptocurrencies. I'm so excited. And here. so, uh, you know, the, a lot of people are in cryptocurrencies. They're not interested in equities and bonds anymore because they're not volatile enough and you can't get rich as quickly as in <laughs> cryptocurrencies. I suppose you can't lose as much money as quickly as in cryptocurrencies. Mm. But that is another story. But basically, the world is very complex. Now, the thing is, I worked first at White Weld, an American investment bank, until 1978. And then I opened the offices for Drexel Burnham Lambert in 1978 in Hong Kong and ran Asia uh, for securities until 1990. And then I went on my own. But after year 2000, I noticed a change of business. And so I still have an office in Hong Kong, but I moved basically to uh, Thailand where I live when I'm not traveling. And as a result of being in Chiang Mai, I don't attend any cocktail parties and I don't need to go to analyst meetings and I don't waste a lot of time with lunches and this and that. So I have much more time to actually read and think. Mm. And I have Bloomberg on my computer, the traveler terminal, so I get the quotes. Essentially, at the same time, everybody else gets them. Mm. And so I have a lot of time to read. But I have to say, whereas in the past, I could write maybe one report in two days. Mm. Now it takes me at least a week. Okay. Because... In order for people to actually pay something for a report, it has to be something a little bit special. Otherwise, they can just go to any blog or website or open CNBC or then they may not be better informed. They may be misinformed, but never mind. That's what they watch. Yeah. Well, you are the editor of the <laughs> Bloom Boom Doom Report, editor and publisher. And I want to chat quickly on those three points. And when you're looking out towards not 10 years, but the immediate future of the next few years, what is the thing, not necessarily globally, but maybe an innovation, a region, something that particularly excites you about a future economic opportunity? Well, if I look around, you know, well-to-do families, and I deal mostly with uh, families that are very well-to-do, their family offices and they are financial institutions and this and that, and uh, what strikes me is that you can have people in Europe, they have maybe a portfolio of a few hundred million dollars in equities and bonds, but they may have just 5% of that money in emerging economies. Mm. And I think it's a huge mistake because today already, I just looked at the statistics, China uh, consumes more commodities than all the other industrial countries together. Mm. So it's a huge economic power. And you look at, say, the market share in China of computers, of mobile phones, of anything. It's mostly a local affair. You know, Apple may be famous in America and in Europe, but in China it's not a factor. Maybe they have a 3% market share of the mobile market. Mm. Uh, Samsung is a little bit larger, but then... All the others are local companies. Or you look at cig cigarette sales. In America and in Europe, say Marlboro might be the number one brand. But in China, there's all local brands. Mm -hmm. And beer, most of you read listeners wouldn't know that. But the largest brand in terms of sales of beer is Snow. Oh, yeah. The second largest is Qingdao. And among the 10 largest brands, four are Chinese. So, in my opinion, a normal investor, he should look at the world and no longer say, oh, America is big and they have technology. Well, China, I can tell you, they have, they apply now annually for many more patents than the US. Mm -hmm. Many more, not just a few. So it means they have developed their own technology. And Trump, 
is a complete moron who thinks that the Chinese companies are stealing technology from the US. They may have done that a long time ago, as the US stole technology from Europeans and uh, the British yeah. 120 years ago. You understand? That's the progress. Uh, people invent something and then a new generation will benefit from that invention. It's like, why are they cryptocurrencies? Well, they are cryptocurrencies because the internet functions. Mm -hmm. But the internet was not invested by the people that created cryptocurrencies. And strictly analyzed, if you look at cryptocurrencies, why are they cryptocurrencies? Because people are fed up with the banks mm -hmm. and they don't trust the central banks anymore. So they created a new asset class that is outside the banking system. And that is all very desirable. I have no view whether these cryptocurrencies would go up or down. Right. And I really don't care. But it's in a way a brilliant symptom of the excess liquidity these F central bankers have created. Mm -hmm. Then some academics will tell you, well, there's a shortage of assets. Then they developed a few years ago the asset shortage theory. No, there's no shortage of assets. You can buy anything, any piece of land. There's an oversupply of money that has been created by central banks through the asset purchases by central right. banks. And so in a way, I'm very happy about cryptocurrencies because when you think about it, they completely discredit central bankers. Yes. That they didn't count. And Yellen, for sure, she's dumb like the moon. She would never have <laughs> thought of cryptos in her life. She never thought of asset inflation in her life. I think a lot of people also just wholly trust banks in terms of security. And a lot of people don't realize that banks are not 100% safe. I know people that had money in... <laughs> The Bank of Cyprus, when that went bust not too long ago, big boom to Bitcoin. And I'm sure in, in your lifetime, you've seen a lot of other bank failures. You know, do you think banks get generally are getting safer over time or less safe? I think the central banks have bailed out the system so many times that the next station is really a systemic crisis where things don't function anymore where no matter how much money they print and intervene, it just breaks down. can be a social event, you know, kind of revolutions, uh, not necessarily with weapons, but it can be a silent resistance. And, you know, there are lots of things that can happen. Or we could have cyber war. Mm -hmm. We have now hackers. Of course, the U.S. media will always say, the hackers are from Russia, they are from China, they are from uh, North Korea, as if there are no hackers anywhere else in the world. Right. But this is the way the media in the U.S. kind of treats the world. You know, there's a small demonstration. Say in Thailand, about three years ago, there were demonstrations. And in one area of Bangkok, which is maybe not even a square mile wide. There were some people that put fire on cars or whatever. CNN and the other media outlets, they managed to portray as if the whole country was in flames. Yeah. Here in Chiang Mai, then, it was perfectly peaceful. And also my wife, she has a condo in Bangkok in her area. There were no demonstrations. It was perfectly quiet. But the media, in order to sell its garbage, they have to portray everything as if it's a complete disaster. And you look at uh, the reporting on Syria. First of all, whatever goes wrong, it's uh, Assad, who is the villain. Mm -hmm. He is the only one in the whole world who uses chemical weapons. Mm -hmm. And there's no evidence about it. Number two... He treats the other people badly and he attacks and kills and so forth. You never see that the, what the rebels do and what ISIS has done. That is not the subject of discussion. In any event, uh, the reporting is very biased. They also portray <laughs> Kim Jong-un uh, Jong 
as a madman, he is actually maybe not mad at all. He's a calculating individual who has managed, and that you have to give him credit for that. He's a small country, completely. 99% of Americans wouldn't know where he is, where North Korea is. And he has managed to stand up to the U.S. You have to think about this. Yeah. It's, I mean, quite remarkable. Uh, and his reaction is actually exactly the right one in the sense that people who the U.S. disliked, Gaddafi, Assad, Saddam Hussein, all the Ayatollahs, most of these people, they've been disposed. Mm -hmm. If they didn't have the willpower to stand up and some bargaining power, for sure the U.S. would have already invaded North Korea. But tough luck for the U.S. North Korea is, of course, alive and doing what it does because of China. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, this is what I tried to explain before. We live in a very complex world and it's like a huge machine. And their parts, they interact, and occasionally the machine breaks down. That can happen. That's the systemic risk. Yeah. Because we've postponed these risks for so long. The government's borrowed more and more money. Uh, each time the economy slows down, they just throw more money at the system. Puerto Rico has a disaster. The federal government has to come in and help. And so yeah. there's no longer... A society where people help themselves. Something goes wrong, or the government should help. Yeah. But they don't realize that if you say the government should help, then you also lose your freedom. It's funny you mentioned Bangkok and the protest, or quote-unquote protest, from a few years back. I was actually in Bangkok during that time, <laughs> yeah. and it was all happening just two blocks away from me. Mm -hmm. and I would look out the window and see it all going on, and I would go down there with them and hold the Thai flag and for the most part, it was completely calm, and the media made it look like there was about to be a civil war. Yes, because in Thailand, it's like in the Philippines, demonstrations is mm -hmm. part of a party. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the carnival in the Philippines yeah. is not a revolution where people... I've seen revolutions, mm -hmm. you know, like in Hungary in '56 and in uh, the Czech Republic in 1968 when uh, we had the... Czech Spring, spring, and the Russians walked in on August 18th. Mm -hmm. But here in Thailand, usually demonstrations are rather peaceful. Right. How significant do you think the current, we'll call it the tech revolution, do you think that in the future, say 50 or 100 years, we'll look back on what's happening right now in technology, generally based in Silicon Valley, do we think we'll, we'll look back at this as a significant of an event as, say, the Industrial Revolution was to history? Well, we have to distinguish the Industrial Revolution is uh, oversimplified because with the Reformation in Europe, a lot of inventions were carried out. Uh, what really then led to the rapid growth after 1800, you know, until about 1850, the global population was less than a, a billion people. So... There were huge progress made in agriculture. And uh, in the 19th century, the really uh, game-changing invention was actually railroads. Mm. Because previously, from, say, 10,000 BC uh, until the introduction of the rails, people traveled at the same speed. They were on horses and some walked. But nobody traveled at a much faster speed. But after the railroad, and it had a huge impact also militarily, you could move troops from, say, the south of uh, Europe to the north, or from uh, Western Europe, say Berlin or wherever it is, to the east, to Moscow. So that really changed the world. And it also allowed in America for trade to flourish. The second big thing, and this wasn't really an invention that had existed before, was the construction of canals in the U.S. Because that allowed uh, grains to be shipped around. And so forth. of course we then had the invention of the telegraph and the telephone and the electricity. But 
a mind-boggling invention was really the tractor. Was, with the tractor, one farmer, he could essentially, there was, after the tractor, there were many improvements, but one tractor allowed a farmer to look after a farm with maybe three or four employees, whereas before, he had 3,000 employees that were harvesting. And so we had many big inventions. I think, for me, because I started to work in 1970, at that time, every brokerage office around the world, they had a huge uh, mailing department right. <laughs> and telex department in Zurich at the office and also in Hong Kong. We had maybe five or six telex operators. And in Hong Kong, when I arrived, there weren't any TV stations that broadcasted stocks like Bloomberg TV nowadays or CNBC or CNN. And people didn't have quotation machines. In At White Weld in 1973, we had one Reuters machine for the whole office. And that machine gave you quotes, and that's it, no information. And so the New York office would send to White Weld overnight information by telex. The next day, the Hong Kong office would print this information out, plus a quotation list, we say of 100 or 200 stocks that the clients of White World owned, and then that was printed, and then messengers would run around the whole of Hong Kong and bring it to the clients, so the clients would get it around 11 in the morning or noontime. Mm -hmm. This was a major undertaking. And then sometimes at the end of the 70s, early 80s, the fax machine came up. That facilitated already business and, you know, I could travel. And in the morning, someone from the Hong Kong office would fax the quotes to me. So I would get all the time the quotes from New York. So if I went to a client, I didn't have to tell him, oh, the market went down sharply and then but that day it went up. <laughs> so, uh, and then other quotation services aside from Reuters came up. First, it was Telerate, which was Dow Jones. A complete failure. But then Bloomberg started. And Bloomberg then took a lot of business away from Reuters and it's a relatively user friendly system. So a lot of people nowadays use Bloomberg, including myself. And this along with the internet and, you know, the internet is uh, in a way something mind boggling as well as the mobile phone. When I started to work, we didn't have mobile phones and the first ones came up. But even in the early 1990s, I just couldn't imagine that someone would, with a mobile phone, send a picture to somebody else through the air. Mm. I just couldn't imagine. Still bothers my mind. And, you know, you may say, well, you're a simple mind, yeah. But Kodak and Polaroid didn't see this development either. And the analysts didn't, because when I started to work, there were two big photos photography companies in the world and they were as popular as say Google is today in terms of standing the analyst at White Well she followed Polaroid and Kodak she kept on telling us if one day Asia becomes rich how many cameras they would buy, <laughs> how many films they would consume yeah. and this is, there are many more photographs today made every day Jeez then she could have imagined would be made in one year. But it's not done with a film. It's done electronically. Stored. And, you know, these are changes that are huge. And I always say, I started to work, you know, in 1970. So I've been now close to 50 years in this business. But when I think at the changes that have occurred, and many of these changes I kind of visualize that Asia would rise and that China would open up and that China would become an important uh, country as well as India and so forth and so on. But still, many other changes I just didn't imagine right. would be possible. I didn't think that, you know, already in the mid-80s, my friends and I, my friends were chief strategists at Merrill Lynch and they published very good reports. They said the excessive debt will kill the system already in the 80s. 
end up today, we have more and more and more debts, yeah. and the deficits are larger and larger, and so forth, and the system still functions. Mm. We couldn't have imagined, or, you know, in the 60s and 70s, the market, the Dow Jones, had hit the high of, I think, a thousand already in 1964, or thereabouts. And then in 66, it hit another high of a thousand. And in 1973, it was a little bit above a thousand, I think about 1,070 or something like this. But by 82, the Dow Jones was still below 800. And Robert Prechter of the Elliott Wave, he wrote a book in the late 70s and said the market will go up to 2,300. Mm-hmm. And people thought this guy is not, is a nut case. The market uh, is not going to go anywhere. And then the market in 82 started to rally. And when the crash occurred in 87, and by the way, it's now 30 years, mm-hmm. the market between August 28th, that was the top, 2,742, it dropped to 1,600 within two months, yeah. down 42%. Mm-hmm. In one day, down 21%, October 19th. And so I, I remember these things because I was in business. <laughs> right. It was an unbelievable event. But anyway... If you had said to anyone, the market will go over 20 cents, they would have said, you know, you better go to a home for cuckoos, <laughs> for cuckoo people. So what I want to say, the changes are so huge in a brief period of time that nobody knows how the world will look like in 5, 10 years or 20. Maybe in 10, 20 years, we don't have democracies anymore. Yeah. You know, that I think is quite likely. Maybe the whole Social Security Administration will be gone. People may get a fixed salary, you know, from the government, like in socialist republics at the time, like in Russia. And we can have huge changes, but for sure, there'll, there'll be a lot of changes, both in terms of technology and in terms of society. Paul Merriman, <coughs> a, a well-known fund manager, once told me that when we were discussing investing at this point not too long ago when markets are at all time high and there's a lot of a lot of new investors in the world now a big millennial generation that's looking to start to invest and everyone's nervous and we were talking to him and he said you know in my lifetime it's never looked good the forecast has never looked good you've always had the threat of war disease famine depression do you feel the same that over the course of your lifetime the future is always had things that would be very concerning to investing money looking ahead? Yes, but, you know, some people have looked at the world from a a rosy picture and they're always optimistic and I've met strategists that always say, you know, buy and, you know, in the long run stocks will go up, which in a way is true. Stocks do go up in the long run, except it's not the same stocks like a hundred years ago that go up. Right. It's not the same stock. You look today at the NASDAQ 100, it's not the stocks that were in the NASDAQ 100 in the year 2000 that are driving the market. It's companies that all went public after 2000, after the last tech crash. Google, I think they went public in 2004. Facebook, uh, Amazon was already public Mm -hmm. in 1999. But a lot of others were not public. And so these stocks are different stocks than what drove the market before. When I started to work, the big tech company that dominated the world was basically IBM. Right. And then you had digital for mini computers, Boros, uh, Sperry Rand, and two or three others. But basically... Of all these companies, IBM is still alive, but it hasn't performed well. It's a dog, not not a big company anymore. And so, because we have so many changes in technology, we also have frequently a change in leadership. I mean, you know, this nobody thought about three years ago, that the money managers who are invested in stocks and bonds have been essentially humiliated by cryptocurrencies. I mean, when you think of it, uh, 
they didn't invest in cryptos. And so some of them are very anti-crypto. And then the young people who have little investment experience, who may think it's a sure thing, uh, they invest in cryptos. And it's not a sure thing. We don't know exactly what the value eventually will be and which one will be the dominating cryptocurrency. Mm. But, I, I, you know, I'm not an expert. And if someone would lecture me and tell me I'm more wrong, that I should put all my money into cryptos, I will listen, but I wouldn't do it because my approach, and you know, you came here to talk about how to make money, and so it was my approach is the slow approach. Most important is not to lose money. Right. <laughs> and you want to be diversified, so some assets will perform well and some won't, but you don't, I've known so many people, they were rich, and they overplayed, and then they lost it all. But all. Oh, and it's tough to start again and make it again. Some people have managed to do that, but not everybody. By the way, you want a beer? I would love one. Perfect. Chong out of the can? It's beautiful. Thank you, sir. I give you a Thank you very beer. much. So anyway, to make a long story short, uh, yeah, I always... I mean, when I started to work at... White Weld and Drexel, I took huge risks. That I don't do anymore. Yeah. I think the thing that scares me the most about the world as an investor and potentially just as a citizen of the world is the global debt that's being accumulated. And I think that the reason it bothers me so much is because I just don't understand it well enough. But it just seems like it can't be sustainable. I heard you mention you know, back in the 70s and 80s, people were saying that it couldn't be sustained. And, and now... We look at where it's at now. Do you see the global debt or the debt of a particular Western country as one of the most threatening things to the, to the global economy? Or is it some other factor? I mean, I think the debt level is very high. And what it does is it uh, 100% retards economic growth. That we have to be aware. Uh, with the kind of level of debts we have and... Uh, the kind of government regulation we have uh, in Western Europe and in the U.S. growth will be very disappointing. Mm -hmm. Plus, since your audience uh, is uh, largely millennials, I just want to mention that GDP statistics are pretty much meaningless. <laughs> what is meaningful is, are the standards of living of people going up or down? Are there inflation-adjusted earnings going up or down. And to that, I have to say, when I started to work, I had a salary of 4,000 Swiss francs in Zurich, okay? But I had an apartment behind the theater in Zurich. In other words, best location. It wasn't a luxury. Well, it was kind of a high-end building. And it had uh, one bedroom and one large living room, a large kitchen and a large bathroom, and a cellar and an attic. And it cost 290 francs. In other words, I earned 4,000 and my apartment was less than 300. Mm -hmm. So not even 10% of my salary. Please find me anyone who lives in New York, Los Angeles, Zurich, Geneva, Hong Kong, Singapore, who will only spend less than 10% yeah. on his rent. And the young people today, they have been basically cheated out by central banks. You see, when I started to work, interest rates were at 6%. So I could just put my money at 6%. Then in the 70s, uh, the treasury bond yield went from 6% in 1970 to over 15%. So, yeah, you had a capital loss on bonds, but your reinvestments were always at the higher yield. So, eventually, when interest rates fell in the 80s, you made a lot of money. And at 6%, your money doubles every 12 years. If you can put today a $1,000 on deposit and it doubles every 12 years and you will live until, say, 100, mm -hmm. I, I tell you, you die a very rich mm -hmm. man. Because the compounding impact is huge. And so these were periods when salaries were high 
relative to asset prices. The Dow Jones, as I told you, was hovering around between 800 and, say, 1,000. And the yield on the Dow was around 5%, and uh, it was selling below book value, and the market cap as a percent of the economy in the U.S. was around 25-30%. Uh, housing was cheap, paintings. I was offered in New York when I worked there a uh, Mark Rosco for 25,000 U.S. Mm. I think I could have bought it for twenty. Now it's worth millions. And I had a girlfriend, she wanted to buy it. I told her, are you crazy to pay so much for this shit? <laughs> <laughs> that people so, think about cryptocurrency anyway, now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, and I met a girl in 19, I think about 73 or so. And she was very cultured, small, not particularly good looking, but that's something, you know, appealing about her. And she had a large apartment on Madison and about 58, 60s, mm-hmm. around that area on Madison. Nice building. I think she had about four bedrooms, you know, seven rooms, the apartment. And I asked her, by the way, she said to me that she's moving to San Francisco and uh, because she was writing a book. So first of all, I thought, this dummy, if she will ever sell a single copy of her F book, I'd be damned. <laughs> <laughs> and every book, She's written thereafter, sold many million copies, is Daniel Steele. Wow. And then her apartment, she's the mark, if you want, you can buy the apartment. I said, how much is it? She said, this was at the trough of the bear market in 74. She said, well, you probably can get it for like 50,000 US. So I said, it's impossible such a big apartment for 50,000. There must be a hook. She said, well, the hook is... The maintenance is about 2000 a month. And, you know, I wasn't rich at the time. Yeah. I thought it's a bargain. But to burden myself with the carrying cost mm. of this maintenance, I didn't buy it. But on two occasions, I was totally wrong. A, that she would become a right. big, Her first book was going home. It became an instant success. Mm. And she is not a Nobel Prize winner in um, literature. But her books are were sold at airports all over yeah. the world. Yeah. It's amazing. Wow. Well, I'm glad you brought up the point of GDP versus standard of life. And then I think there's also another important one, which is quality of life. And we're, we're sitting here in Chiang Mai, spent a lot of time around <coughs> Southeast Asia and, and other developing markets in South America. And I, I see the same thing happening in all countries in terms of their economic policy. It seems like everyone's chasing GDP. And that ends up forming a lot of the, their basis for different policies, such as immigration and, and, and what have you. But GDP alone and standard of life, I don't know if it, in this day and age is the best metric. Because, say, here in Chiang Mai, the locals are very happy. It doesn't mean they have a standard of life that would be the same as most in the Western world, but they seem to be a lot happier. Today at age, we have data, we have artificial intelligence, we have so many systems in place. Don't you think it, it's time that we create some type of new metric that government should be focused on more than just GDP and improving standard of life overall? Well, that's uh, that's actually good that you raise this issue because we have in the world the so-called happiness index. Right. Burton. Or and they, they measure, you know, I don't know exactly how they measure it, but basically they measure are people happy and so forth. Interestingly enough, uh, people in Bhutan are very happy. It's a country squeezed between essentially China, uh, Tibet, and India. But I have some reservations about that statistic about Bhutan. But the other countries that are reasonably happy are the Nordic countries. You know, Finland, Norway, Sweden. They have very high tax regimes. And I once or I raised the issue several times because I travel quite regularly to Scandinavia with people and I said, well, doesn't it disturb you to pay such high taxes? And they say, well, the tax is very high, but we also get something for it. I think the bad part is you pay high taxes and you get nothing in return. Like in the US, they spend on health care as a percent of the economy more than twice as much as any other country in Western Europe and in the world anyway. In China or in India, the per capita 
uh, expenditure on healthcare is very low. But anyway, in Scandinavia or also in Switzerland and uh, in Denmark, you get very good health care. You know, you pay for it, but then you can go essentially to the best hospitals and it's you're attended to properly. Your children, I mean, I'm not familiar. I went to private school in Switzerland, but at that time there were maybe altogether five private schools in Switzerland. Everything else was government. And my parents put me in a private school because they thought this idiot is better off in a private school <laughs> than in a government school. So anyway, this was the outcome. And But nowadays in America, you cannot, you know, you live in New York, you have to send your children to like a private nursery, private school, and so forth. So you, the, the school system is a disaster in the US. And we, we have statistics. They spend more and more on education in the US, but the standards of education if anything, have rather gone down in the U.S., not up. Mm. And so the efficiency of government spending is very important. And in uh, small countries like Scandinavia, it functions best better because they are small countries. In fact, I think, you know, one of the reasons democracy functions halfway in Switzerland, not 100% but mm. halfway, is that the country is small. So people have a common interest. They have kind of common... Uh, goals a little bit like a country club. Yeah. You know, if you belong to a country club, the members are actually quite keen to keep to keep it clean. They're quite ke- keen to have a room, a dining room, where maybe children are not allowed <laughs> that scream <Right>. the whole <laughs> evening. So these kind of things you can do in a small society. In a big society, maybe you can't. Yeah. Growing up, my parents always used to say that it was our generation that that concerned them, that worried them. They thought that machines and computers would take over everything, not necessarily as some people are saying AI could potentially do in the future, but just that if you're not tech savvy, you might be left behind. And then it turns out that my generation and millennials have created so many new of these new tech companies that have created a lot of jobs. And it doesn't look like it's all that bad for our generation, but there's concerns for the future generation. What would you... What would be your biggest concern for the the millennials' children that are either just being born or or not yet into this world? Well, I'm not particularly worried about, you know, technology taking away jobs because no technology has taken as much jobs away as agriculture. You know, the invention of the tractor I just mentioned Mm -hmm. before and the combine machines. I went to a farm of a friend of mine in uh, South Dakota, and this farmer is alone. Of course, he has special skills. He needs to be kind of a mechanic as well, because he operates pretty much alone a huge farm with maybe three or four thousand acres. But he's alone basically doing that. But he needs to be able to fix the machines and he has all this expensive equipment. It's a huge capital investment to do that. Uh, but so, until 1930 in the U.S., there were more people in agriculture than in any other industry. After 1930, this then changed a lot. And today, employment in agriculture is maybe 2% of the population, maximum, yeah. maximum. So this has changed a lot, but they found employment somewhere else. And I think when I look at the world, what has been constant for the last, since we have humans, they were eating. There was always prostitution. That is a business that has no obsolescence. Mm-hmm. That will continue. Uh, they always had some kind of cuckoo doctors, you know, fortune tellers and so forth. And there was always superstition. Uh, some people will say this is unkind to say of religion. But basically religion is a huge business. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it's in Thailand, you go to the temples and so forth, uh, the GDP that they actually collect is huge, yeah. astronomical. And the same with the Catholic Church throughout history. <laughs> they looked after themselves <coughs> because they basically sold tickets to heaven. Yeah. And so forth and so on. And the Muslims are no better and the followers of the Aga Khan are no better either. It's a huge business that has endured. And I believe there are lots of businesses that will endure 
my concern about the say younger generation is that when I grew up, we grew up with iron discipline. I mean, at dinner in with the family, with the, my grandparents and so forth, we were only supposed to talk if we were addressed. Of course, we never kept the rules, mm-hmm. but and my grandfather yes. would shout at us. <laughs> but in general, you had to behave. You had to be on time. I went to the Boy Scouts. If you arrived late, you were out, you know, after a while. Same in the army. And uh, when I think of, say, hiring young people, then I think, well, if the whole day they're on Facebook and so forth, I, I really can't use them. I have a friend, he works on a platform, he's a diver, now he's supervising divers. He says, on the, on the platform I went recently, it's run by Asians, they switch off the internet during the day, because otherwise all the employees are always on their mobile phones. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of millennials, they have to, you know, learn. Essentially, wealth does not come from trading bitcoins. Right. You know, of course, every lottery will have a winner. And then if by accident a lottery has twice the same winner, he can write a book and say, how I became rich by playing in the lottery. But basically, it comes from hard work and uh, from applying new ideas, you know, to work also productively. And there I... S- and we have statistics about declining productivity. Now, I'm always a little bit skeptical about all kinds of statistics because you, you can twist around a lot of things. But I believe that major advances have already been made. There are some improvements. Basically, Facebook is a huge invention when you think about it. Unfortunately, it is not used very productively. Mm. You know, most people... They Wait, put no. up their own pictures and look at their own pictures. Yeah. This is a change in society. We traveled a lot as children with my mother because we always went outside Switzerland on holidays and we took photographs. We always hated to put ourselves on a photograph. We enjoyed taking a picture of a cathedral or of a, you know, Roman monument or a bridge or whatever it is but not with people on it. It was not deemed to be modest and humble that you would put your own picture up. I agree with with everything you said about the concerns for the future generation. I was raised in a a very disciplinary, conservative upbringing. And when I, especially when I go to the U.S. now, I see a lot of children of the age 5 to, say, 12, they're uncontrolled, out of control at restaurants, speaking out, <laughs> speaking against people, just very, g- generally just very rude. And I worry about the future generation, especially in the U.S., of potentially an undisciplined generation coming up and being a voting block and voting for higher taxes on a productive minority of people and continuing to drive the welfare system up and up and almost making the producers... Uh, yeah, yeah. A less desirable group to be. It has already happened. We see this, that uh, an entire generation is in favor of a basic income. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not ruling out a basic income straight out, uh, straight out of the question, but you cannot have what we already have and add to it the basic income. Yeah. It doesn't add up. You can replace what we already have is a lousy social security system and all kinds of benefits that lead to a huge, but I repeat, huge abuse. Mm-hmm. You know, there's some people, they're probably offices, they know how to game the system, how to take advantage of the system. The immigrants that come from North Africa and the Middle East to Europe, they know exactly which country pays how much. So, <laughs> I went to Poland a year ago. I said, do you also have a, a migration crisis here? They said, no, they, nobody comes here. I said, why? They said, we don't pay anything. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so they go, they used to go to Poland or Hungary and then on to Austria where they pay a little bit more. Then they go on to Germany. They pay a right. little bit more in yeah. German, more benefit. And the ultimate El Dorado is Switzerland. Yeah. And some people in Switzerland, they you can't imagine what they get. Some 
uh, refugee from Eritrea, they arrive and they say the political refugees. So they come with five children or whatnot and they get the house and this and that. It costs the government, say for a family, $10,000 a month. And who is at the airport flying on a holiday to Eritrea? These political refugees. <laughs> It's a complete joke. Yeah. And I always say the bigger the government, the more abuse you have. And I've been to socialist countries. You can't imagine uh, the, the thing that actually functioned well in socialist countries uh, that kept them actually alive was the black market, mm -hmm. was thriving. But the abuse of the system was astronomical. Yeah. Everybody was cheating. I would also look at that, that when I look at world population right now, where how it's grown over the last hundred years, where it's projected to grow over the next hundred years. And you, you look at what's driving population growth. And, and certainly one of the factors is the ability <laughs> to go abroad and, and re-emit money. If you look at uh, the Philippines, I love Filipinos, but 20, 28% of their GDP is money remittance. It, Basically, have a bunch of kids, send them abroad, and they send back a ton of money. And yeah, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. But at least they work. You True. understand? Milton Friedman, he wrote a very good book, actually. And it's very simple to read, and your listeners should buy it, because you can read it in, say, a day or two. And it's understandable, because most economic books are not understandable. They're written by some idiot. Uh, from an Ivy League university that has never worked mm -hmm. in the private sector. Or, you know, they write about crime. Right. They never had to do with criminals. If you have to do with criminals, then you know how crime, organized crime works. Mm -hmm. And I was privileged to have actually had some dealings <laughs> with organized crime. <laughs> so I know exactly how the system works. And they're like cockroaches, they come up everywhere and you just can't wipe them out. Mm -hmm. They change their methods, but they're still there. Yeah. But anyway, uh, the point is the governments, they become big and they retard economic growth and limit your freedom. That's why the book by Friedman, Capitalism and Freedom is very good because he explains that very well. And it, it's a trade-off. The more government, say 100% government, then you have the Soviet Union, you have no freedom. Mm -hmm. Or, well, you have a little bit of freedom, but not much. Or you have a totally free society, but then you have to take personal responsibility. I read a book called The Creature of Jekyll Island, and it painted a, a very glim picture <laughs> of what a, a, what a potential hyperinflation situation could look like for the USA, the US dollar being the, 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 reserve currency of the world and if that ever was not the case all this money that the u.s has printed could end up back on the u.s soil and cause hyperinflation do you think that this is a possibility and this also goes into this would be an extraordinary view of cryptocurrencies but if so many people started adopting cryptocurrencies naturally that money would be fl flooding from fiat currencies into cryptocurrencies could that create a, a hyperinflation scenario, especially for the u.s dollar well I, I You know, we have to define inflation. In a way, we have hyperinflation in the sense that the Dow is no longer a thousand, but it's 22,000, you know. And uh, a house that in the 70s would sell for a hundred thousand dollars is now worth maybe a million. Mm -hmm. Or uh, inflation is defined as an increase in the quantity of money and that we had. We didn't have hyperinflation in consumer goods like a computer or a mobile phone, you know, the price has rather gone down. But services have gone up, you know, your health care. If you're an American, you pay every year more and more for your health care insurance. Ditto in uh, Europe, and you pay more and more for education, you pay more and more for transportation. I mean, all these things, they go up. And that's why I say the standards of living of millennials in particular, their wages haven't gone up that much. But the cost of living has gone up a lot. Mm. And what you hinted at, this is a thought I had also. I always thought if they print so much money, then in nominal terms, stocks and real estate and stamps and everything can go up. Mm. It may go down against precious metals. What has happened now, it went down against 
cryptocurrencies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you think of, you could say, oh, Bitcoin is up from $200. Mm-hmm. I beg your pardon. Can I have one of these? Yeah, sure. You know, you can uh, have a cryptocurrency. You could say the Bitcoin is up from $200 to over $4,000. Mm. I can also say cryptocurrencies were stable. It's just that the paper money collapsed right. against a unit of account which cannot be increased at the whim of a academic sitting in a central bank who has no F idea about how economics work. So these are things, you know, we have to think about. Uh, as I said, I'm diversify our own real estate, I own such stocks and bonds, and cash and uh, precious metals. I don't own any cryptos, but this is something I will have to consider. Now, I believe... Uh, there will be a colossal bubble in cryptos and a lot of things will collapse and then there will be a good opportunity. You don't need to be the first one in whatever boom there is. I want to summarize in a, or close out rather in a couple of questions, just not necessarily about economics, but about life. Yes. Okay. And what you've experienced. We're sitting here in Thailand, wonderful country. Thailand to me was always my plan B and it's, it's become more of my plan A. I love, I love the country here. If you were reborn in any country, all things considered, potential opportunities, economics, political systems, which country right now would you want to be reborn in as a citizen of? I would choose again Switzerland. And I'll tell you why. My brother, he has, uh, okay, now they're also 15 and 18 children. He's, a, he's 73. They went free of charge to schools in Switzerland. And good schools. Uh, they had, he gets allowances for his children and so forth. So actually his tax burden is not huge. It is higher than say in Hong Kong and Singapore, where he gets a lot for that. Incidentally, you want uh, another beer? Yeah. You know, you have good education, so it's a good start. I mean, I, I would essentially do the same as I've done. After a while, I would move out. And I had a very good life in Switzerland, very privileged because I was in the Swiss ski team and so forth, and I knew a lot of people, and I had gone to private school and then then. But I wanted always to go somewhere where I wouldn't know anyone mm. and build my own life and with my own freedom. And so I went to first New York in 1970 and then in 73 to Hong Kong, and I was fortunate, but uh, this is what I would do. Mm. I would nowadays no longer learn Latin and, uh, you know, we spend so much time learning useless stuff really at school. Well, I, I would learn Chinese and I would learn maybe, you know, Russian or whatever it, it is, but I wouldn't spend a lot of time on Latin. Mm-hmm. It's helped me a little bit because I can speak Italian and Spanish and so forth not perfectly well, but I can understand it and I can if I'm in Argentina for three days, then it comes back. Being in Asia, I obviously don't speak frequently uh, Spanish or Italian, but uh, I try to speak French because I have some French friends here and French-speaking French. So the French is, has stayed relatively current. So, Dr. Farber, looking at the world right now, we have this, this continued push towards globalization. It looks like we're moving closer and closer to a united world, potentially fewer countries, larger government. And we also have these these events like Brexit recently. We have Catalonia just voting out. We have a lot of populist movements. Do you think 100 years from now we'll be in fewer countries, larger government, larger united body of government? Or do you think we'll be in you know, potentially a, a place where we have more countries and smaller governments? Yeah, this is a good question and nobody knows for sure. Maybe we go through different stages. That first we have more large countries and then uh, there will be revolutions. You call this uh, party populism. I mean, I don't believe in this populism uh, concept. I believe populism is basically voters who vote for what they think is right. Usually it's the wrong person. You know, you could say Trump is a populist leader. He was able to galvanize people who were very unhappy with the present system. And there'll be, of course, more people like that. And 
in the past, we had royalties and we had the feudal system. We had uh, all kinds of system, also religious system, you know, like Egypt was built essentially around the priests, the high priests and the pharaoh who was like a god. And I believe democracy is an experiment, has not proven itself to be successful in the long run. Now, someone may say, well, look, uh, the world has become so rich under democracy. Well, I can tell you, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, uh, China, and there are only 20% of countries in the world that have a higher GDP per capita than China. So it's been a big success. It's not a democracy. Uh, I think that, uh, that for sure, that I'm for sure, in a hundred years, there's no democracy. Right. It may be a different system, you know, where uh, small countries, they have a ruling class that is more closer to the people. At the moment, the governments have very little to do with the ordinary people. Mm-hmm. Mrs. Merkel, she doesn't live in an area that is surrounded by refugees, right. nor does uh, the White House <laughs> have, <laughs> you know, homeless people around the White House. So these people, there's a different class. Like in America, the biggest joke is to say we have a democracy and this American bullshit about exceptionalism. Mm-hmm. But the members of Congress, they are not subject to Obamacare. I mean, you have to think about it. Here we have a democracy, but you have a ruling class mm-hmm. that has different rules and regulations. Mm-hmm. And so many of them were actually convicted and didn't pay any tax, but they're still in government. Yeah, They are, you know, it's like I forgot who said it. The simple criminals, they go to jail and uh, the big criminals are in high offices. <laughs> so, Dr. Farber, for someone who looks at all sides of the world, the gloom, the doom, the doom, and so many other factors, how do you personally position yourself in terms of your investment portfolio to try to cover all bases and stay balanced? Well, again, this is a very good question because traditionally, if you have a system of stable money, and a stable money I would define a system where the quantity of money and credit uh, does not increase at the faster pace than, say, GDP. Mm-hmm. So you have stable money. Then holding money in the bank is perfectly safe because you get not high interest rates. Like in Switzerland, we had in the 50s and 60s, like 1% or 2% interest, but there was not much inflation, higher than 1% or 2%. But basically, there wasn't a huge monetary depreciation. Bonds were giving you a higher yield and they were perceived to be safe, okay? Uh, because you got the interest and after five or ten years, when the debt was due, you got repaid in money that hadn't depreciate in terms of purchasing power. And stocks were deemed to be more risky. Today, when I look at all the investments, you know, stocks, bonds, real estate, precious metals, art and so forth, I have to say that if someone says, oh, the market is too high, meaning the stock market is too high, I keep everything in cash in a bank, I think that person is taking a huge risk. Mm. Because the money in the bank doesn't give him any return, the practically zero interest rates, and you have the central banks printing money, so it means the value of money goes down. So I think that if you really think through a disaster scenario, let's take a disaster scenario that has occurred repeatedly. Germany between 1900 and today. So they had First World War. (laughs) Then they had the German hyperinflation where money became worthless. Then they had the Depression. Then they had the Second World War. Then the occupation and so forth. If you owned the shares of companies like Bayer and BASF and so forth, you still have the ownership of these companies. But if you owned cash, you lost it three times. Mm -hmm. Also in bonds, you lost it three times. If you had overseas holdings, you had some money, you know. Then real estate in Germany, if you were lucky and you owned the real estate in Western Germany, okay, but a lot of 
big landowners, they owned the land in East Germany, which at the time, until about 1910, 1920, was actually Poland. They lost it all. The real estate owners in Russia, the big families, the aristocracy, they lost it all. The big landowners in Shanghai, in China, they lost it all. So, you know, you have to consider if you want to keep your assets, you have to diversify. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't put everything into the same asset. I went to a conference not long ago, and this guy, he had like 5,000 people attending. But already the first time I went to his conference, when he only had about 500 people attending, I thought something is funny about this company. The second time he had 5,000 people and I queried a little bit about the business model. I came away with a very bad impression. I thought it's a Ponzi scheme to rip off people. And at the conference, you know, I couldn't say I don't invest with this company because they invited me as a speaker. (laughs) But I emphasized several times that they shouldn't put all the money into one investment. Yeah. That is the best I could do. But of course, a lot of people, they never listen to that. They put all their money into one thing. And it's always a sure thing. And the sure thing is always something about which they know the least. At the beginning of the 80s, it was Commodore, mm. who was one of the first personal computer manufacturers. And Tandy and... Uh, Atari. And then in the late 80s, early 90s, it became, you know, some stocks like iOmega and uh, US Robotic and Computer Vision, Computer Aided Design as well. And then lately it's been, you know, 3D printing and so forth. So all these stocks, these are brilliant technologies <laughs> and so forth. You don't know for sure how they will evolve yeah. eventually. And all I can say is, the best is to say when you invest, I'm ignorant. I don't know. It can go up. It can go down. It can go up a lot. And it can go down a lot. The downside is usually zero unless you're leveraged. So there's always a risk and a reward. And as I said to you earlier, I think in investing, if you have a 100 and you lose 50, then you're down from a 100 to 50 then you have to make a hundred to be just even. That is very difficult. I tell you, in terms of building wealth, the key is not to lose any money. But Dr. Herber, it's been a joy. Thank you for having me over, sharing your wisdom, your experience, your life. Thanks for wisdom coming on the I'm show. not so sure about. Okay, but how anyway. about thanks for the beers? <laughs> yes, okay, you're welcome. It's been a lot of fun. that thunder really set the mood for that interview (laughs) i was that was great man dr doom he's the man huh great just a great like feel like that was the my most favorite school teacher ever and i got to ask him all the questions that i wanted to ask in one hour instead of over the course of one semester yeah how crazy was that i like what was how did that feel being in his library and drinking beers with him, you know, with the thunder going on in the background and the rain coming down and just kind of knowing that he's been through, you know, seven decades of experience. Dude, this guy is so relaxed. You know, when I was in there asking him the questions, immediately when we sit down, he's just like, you can start whenever you want, start whenever you want. There's no preparation, no questions asked, just fire away. And when you're asking him these questions, you just, you know, some of his explanations and his references in history are extremely deep, but they're all just on the, on the top of his head. And that's what I love about interviewing guys like Dr. Mark Faber, Harry Dent, Paul Merriman. You know, these guys, they just have so much experience and they've done so much research and deep dives into the industry for so long. It's just like, they, it, it's almost, it looks like it's fun for them just to open up this knowledge bank and, and share it with the world. And it was, it was extremely fun. Yeah, I, I can definitely see that, especially like at, at that age, you know, just kind of going through so many things and seeing so many things and kind of just thinking, okay, well, I, let me put all this knowledge out there for the world. Let me, you know, I hope I get to a point in my life where I just stop caring, you know, about 
you know, what people think. And I, I could just say, I'm like, you know, what? I've been through this. This is, this is what I think, you know, take it or leave it. If you like it, you know, you like it. If you don't, you don't, but this is what I, this is what I think. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, it was, I've been studying a lot of, of European history, mainly World War One, World War Two, And so Dr. Faber was from Zurich in 1946, which wasn't that long after the war ended, right? Just a year, basically, although he was a little kid. But hearing the reference of Germany, that's something that I've studied quite a lot of, of what happened in Germany after, you know, building up to World War One, after World War One, leading into World War Two, and the hyperinflation that was caused after World War One. But it was cool to hear him reference it and, and talk about that in a historical context of markets and investing and use it as, you know, here's like, here's a super kind of Armageddon scenario of, of what can happen in markets. And like, if you're in Germany at that time, if you're holding after World War One, if you had cash or bonds, like you, you basically lost it all to hyperinflation. If you owned property on the west side of the country, you won. But if you held it on the east side of the country where the, the Russians occupied, you lost. If you owned companies like stocks, equities, private companies, you did well. But the whole point was, you know, you have to prepare for all these different types of things. And, and this is what we've been learning all throughout the, the podcast and certainly what Dr. Faber prints in his, in his, uh, in his newsletter and all of his research is you just have to put your hands up in the air and say, I don't know what's going to have to happen and I can't predict it, but we have to prepare for all types of situations. Yeah. And also I really liked how he mentioned that. There was never a good time to invest. There, there's always gloom, doom, you know, and booms happening at the same time. Where now it's very easy for us to complain about, you know, let's say low interest rates. I, when I was listening to it, I was thinking, man, he was right. You know, things used to be, you know, so easy where there was, you know, you could put your money into a money market account or, you know, or into something and you get five percent, mm-hmm. or even in a savings account, and you can, it's, you know, you can just. Pretty much be like, okay, well, I'm, I'm saving money. I'm, you know, the U.S. economy is really the, you know, the the big player. I don't even have to think internationally because we drag everyone else down if something happens. But now we have all these other countries, you know, especially Asia, which he talks about a lot, and it's it's not that easy. We can't just put our money in just the U.S. and we can't put our money just in, you know, a savings ac- you know account which gets almost zero percent interest. But at the same time, you know, we have those complaints, but we also have, you know, all these modern opportunities as well that we, we never had before. Yeah. And just to echo and underscore that, what was very interesting, and again, one of the reasons that led us to start this podcast is just the complexity of all these alternative investment options that we have now. And exciting, but also complex. And we were saying 50 years ago, investing was super simple. It was like you maybe own land and a property, you have cash that would accumulate a a good, you know, a moderate size uh, of interest. And then you you might own a little bit of stocks or bonds. But now it's infinite, right? Infinite. And now we have cryptocurrencies and derivatives and all these other things, which makes investing extremely complicated for people of all, you know, of all experience levels, people that are just getting into it, even professionals, there's just endless things to invest in. So, you know, sim- simplifying that, but also hearing the historical context of, of someone who's been through all this and still saying, Hey, it's, it is really complicated now compared to where it was 50 years ago gives us a little bit of reassurance when we go into, to new asset classes or continue to stumble upon investments that we don't know about. And we're just keen to learn more. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting that he is looking into cryptocurrencies i think most you know especially the the older generation or the seasoned investors who are on you know bloomberg and cnbc and fox and these shows they they almost kind of just all dismiss cryptocurrencies that you know they say it's they're not gonna talk about it or that it's just a bubble but he actually is gonna do his due diligence and just you know consider it a an alternative and i'm that like that in itself, you know, even the fact that he hasn't yet invested in it as of the recording of this podcast, but the fact that he's actually considering it and looking into it to me is, you know, kind of a at least a you know if not a green light, you know, maybe at least a yellow light saying you know pr- mm-hmm. proceed with caution, but definitely look into it. That's interesting. Yeah, I was just in, in Saigon last night. I uh, was with Michael Covell, who was on the podcast previously on trend following, and he was saying we were talking about how 
cryptocurrencies are going to uh, have, have futures coming out. And of course, we know there's been speculation and, and already some ETFs that track not only Bitcoin, but all, all types of, of cryptocurrencies. And the amount of his point was that's going to bring so much liquidity to the this asset class that he thinks that's going to be the real catalyst for this stuff to boom, even though he hasn't invested in cryptocurrencies yet. But it's it's just really interesting. Michael Covell is maybe 10 years older than us, Johnny. You know, Mark Faber's got 30 years on us, uh, even more. So it's, it's, it's really interesting hearing all these different generations starting to talk about this stuff. And, and big shout out to Dr. Mark Faber for coming on. That was an awesome episode. Johnny, did you know Snow Beer was the biggest beer in the world? I never even heard of Snow Beer. <laughs> but you're Taiwanese, right? It's called Snow? Snow. S-N-O-W, like... And yeah. literally have never heard of it. So the, the two biggest beers in the world are both Chinese beers. And snow beer, I believe, is like the beer of northern China. And t- uh, was it Ting Sao? You probably heard of that one. Ting, Ting oh, Tao? Sing, Sing Dao, maybe? Sing Dao, yeah. That's like the second biggest one. That's more like in the southern parts. But that was also going into this whole home country bias discussion of... You know, most people have would never guessed that snow beer or never even heard of snow beer, but yet it's the biggest beer company in the world because most people haven't been to China or certainly haven't been to a lot of places in China that drink snow beer. So interesting piece of history and e- economics there as well. Yeah, that's crazy. And it really shows how big this world is and how connected it's going to be because there is a very, very good chance that 40 years, you know, 40 years ago when Mark Faber was our age, you know, like – if you weren't an international traveler, you know, which used to be a lot harder, there, you couldn't just Google, you know, uh, biggest beer brand in the world. Yeah. You had, you had, it, was, it was hard. I mean, I was literally able just to pull it up real quick and say, oh, you know what? I've never heard of it, but now I can see it. Now I can do my research on it. And the fact that this generation, you know, starting with, you know, with Mark, but now with the digital nomad movement is we can take advantage of things like location arbitrage and live in, you know, great cheap places like Chiang Mai while investing in the U S market or in the, you know, in the market in, in India. And this is completely new to our generation. That's a very, very good point. And I think especially for young investors that we talked about this stuff a lot, if you have the opportunity to do these types of things, to live in a, a, a world-class place like Chiang Mai or so many other destinations that cost half of the West. And you can, you can invest your hard-earned earnings and savings into, you know, some of these investments that we've been talking about, but live at a half or a third the price. You're going to have a big, big leg up in, you're going to save and accumulate a lot faster. Yeah, and we'll, we'll definitely have an episode on that. I think that's super important. We'll also have an episode coming up on just investing in cryptocurrencies because I know both Sam and I are getting into it. If you guys want to help support this podcast, make sure we can put out as many episodes as, as we can per month. Please do us a favor and go on iTunes and leave a review. If you've already done it, please just tell your friends about the show because without you guys, we're, we were, we're unable to get these big name guests. We're, we're unable to do you know as many episodes as we would like to do. So please do us a favor. If you guys have gotten a lot of value from this podcast, let your friends know, share it on Facebook or social media, tell a friend, and go on iTunes and leave us a review. Absolutely. Big props to Dr. Mark Faber. Great to know that you're enjoying Chiang Mai as much as Johnny and I do, and we're an early adopter of the Orient, and appreciate you coming on and leaving us with your wisdom and knowledge. Had a blast, Johnny. Looking forward to another episode with you next week, buddy. You as well. See you guys all next week. Thanks for listening to the Best Like a Boss podcast. Join our mailing list at investlikeaboss.com to get exclusive access to our insider investment portfolios and our private members forum. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends and leave us a review in the iTunes store. It helps more than you know. See you guys next week.